Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on synaptic mechanisms. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the Golgi apparatus and uh, anterograde transport of proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi. So, uh, the fancy name for the movement of proteins from the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum to the membrane of the Golgi is anterograde, or forward, transport. Okay, so that's the topic for this video. The Golgi and anterograde transport of proteins. Right, okay, so let me just underline the title. And the structure of this video is going to be, we're going to begin with a basic overview of the ER and the Golgi. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the COP2 protein complex, which stands for the uh, coat protein complex of the second type. And then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk about how the COP2 vesicles, well, the COP2 coated vesicles are going to move, well, firstly bud off from the endoplasmic reticulum, and how they're going to move to the Golgi, and then we'll have a little bit of discussion about fusion. Right, okay, so this is the problem, basically. Let's show it here. So uh, we've discussed so far that if we want to um, get a protein, um, either into the membrane of a cell or if we want to secrete it, what we need to do is it needs to firstly go to the endoplasmic reticulum, which we'll draw here. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum here. So this is the ER for short for endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. And then what it's going to do is it's going to go for another organelle before it can actually go to be secreted. And it's going to basically go for an organ known as the Golgi which I'll draw here. Now the Golgi basically consists of absolutely loads of compartments stacked on top of each other. So these are membrane bound, massive great compartments. And the names for the, the, the fancy name for these massive membrane bound compartments is it's called a cisterna, or the plural is cisterni, right? And often you'll have around seven cisterni uh, uh, stacked on top of each other. So I'll try to draw that many. There you go. Seven cisterni stacked on top of each other. And this whole structure here with these seven cisterni uh, stacked on top of each other, this is the Golgi apparatus. Okay. Whoops. Apparatus. Or the Golgi um, body, I think it's sometimes called. Anyway, the point is, that if you're making proteins that are either membrane bound or which are bound to be secreted by the cell, the first thing that has to happen is it has to go into uh, the endoplasmic reticulum. Then it has to go into a vesicle. Okay, so here's a vesicle which is going to go between the endoplasmic reticulum and the uh, cisterni. And we're going to see that the fancy name for this vesicle is a COP2 coated vesicle. So these vesicles that are moving from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus, uh, those are known as COP2 coated vesicles because they are coated in these uh, COP2 protein complexes. Okay, so uh, vesicles are going to bud off from the endoplasmic reticulum and they're going to make their way to what's known as the cis side of the Golgi. So the side of the Golgi that is facing um, the um, facing the endoplasmic reticulum, this bit here, this is known as the cis Golgi. Okay, right. Uh, now cis, I don't know what language it's from. I think it might be German. No, it's not German. It's probably some ancient language like Latin. Uh, cis means same, basically. So it means that it's on the you know it's on the same side of the cell as the ER. So it's near the ER, whereas. This portion over here, which is far away, the other pole of the Golgi apparatus, and I'm sorry, it's just um, just gone like that. Uh, the camera, I think, has moved. I need to uh, reorient it. It's the paper is slanted now, even though it's uh, even though it's right relative to the camera. That should be the way the camera is oriented. Never mind. I will sort that out in a moment. Uh, so this bit that's away, this portion that's on the away from the AER. This is known as the trans-Golgi. So the portion of the Golgi apparatus that's away from the endoplasmic reticulum is known as the trans-Golgi. Trans in some ancient language, whichever it is, and I suspect it's probably Latin, means across, basically, or a, away, on the other side. 
So, uh, this is the portion that's further away from the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the bit in the middle is then known as the medial Golgi for middle. Okay? So it probably does come from Latin because I think medial definitely comes from Latin. Okay, right. So though that's just a little bit of terminology there about the Golgi. So, uh, what will then happen is the Golgi will release the vesicle where the protein will make its way through the Golgi apparatus. It will go f come in uh, at the cyst side from one of these COP2 coated vesicles, and then it will make its way to the trans Golgi, and then it will be released in a secretory vesicle here. So this is a secretory vesicle, and then it can potentially fuse with the plasma membrane. And either the protein will be in the... Um, uh, the the vacuole of the um, secretory vesicle, in which case it will actually be released into the extracellular space, or it will be in the membrane of the secretory vesicle, in which case it will be released into the plasma membrane. So that's a big overview of what we are looking at here. So now what we want to do is look at this step here. We want to look at these COP2 coated vesicles because this process of taking a protein from the endoplasmic reticulum and taking it into the cis Golgi, that is the process of anterograde transport. So that's the topic for this video. Right, okay, so let's begin with the um, ER member there. I'm just going to sort this camera out now. It's annoying me that it's on this angle, and I don't want to have to cut the video to sort it out, so... Uh, that, I think, is better. There, that's much better. Right, okay. So, uh, let's talk about uh, COP2 complexes then. So, we'll, ha we'll take the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So, here is the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so this is a piece of membrane we've just cut out here. And what we want to do is we want to take, let's say, some cargo protein that's in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So, let's say this is our cargo here. So this is some protein that we want to move from the endoplasmic reticulum membrane to uh, the uh, cis-Golgi membrane. So we'll colour it in turquoise. Okay, so the steps that underlie this are um, quite interesting. So basically, in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, there is a protein known as SEC12. And a lot of the proteins in these sort of pathways involving secretion are, 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 na are called SEC proteins. The reason is that um, a guy long ago, who's still alive actually, it's not that long ago, um, it, who's by the name of Randy Sheckman, I'll write his name down in case you want to go and look him up. Randy Sheckman. He did a lot of experiments into uh, the secretory uh, pathways. And I believe what he did, uh, double N or I'll go for single N, Sheckman. Uh, Randy Sheckman. Uh, he basically took yeast cells and he started putting mutagens onto these poor yeast cells. So he had a yeast cell here, and he was throwing horrible chemicals at the yeast cell. Mutagens that were going to cause DNA damage. And basically, if you throw mutagens at um, yeast cells for long enough, eventually some of those yeast cells uh, start to get impairments in secretory function. I mean, um, you know, most, um, you know, most of the times that you throw mutagens at yeast cells, most of the yeast cells will just get mutations in their DNA that mean that they're going to die. Okay, so lo loads of his yeast cells will die, others will get all sorts of other horrible abnormalities, but some of them, some of them, these mutagens, what they will do is they will cause mutations in proteins that are involved in secretory pathways. Okay, so occasionally some of these cells will get mutations that don't kill them, but cause major problems with their secretory pathways. So with this sort of setup here, okay, and he could tell these cells apart from the other cells because what happened to them is they would fill up with vesicles. They would not be able to fuse their vesicles basically and they fill up with vesicles. So they may they were you could tell which of these cells had problems with secretion because you could see them underneath the microscope. They had really distorted cytoplasm that was full of secretory vesicles because the vesicles were being produced uh, but then they couldn't fuse with the next membrane, so the cell just filled up with secretory vesicles. 
Okay, and basically, Randy Sheckman called these yeast cells, which had this problem that you could tell down the microscope, he called them sec mutants. Okay, and then he didn't stop there. What he did is he looked at what mutations these yeast cells had, uh, which was causing this huge problem, this huge, um, yeah, this disturbance in the secretory pathways. And from that, he could gain an insight into which genes were important in uh, producing proteins that were involved in the secretory pathway. And there were absolutely loads of them, and they were called the SEC proteins. So any protein that's called SEC, it means that it was found to be mutated long ago by Randy Sheckman in one of these yeast cells that had major impairments in secretory function, basically. So a lot of the proteins uh, that are involved in secretory pathways are called SEC. Okay, so that's where SEC comes from. Right. Um, and uh, SEC12 then, so I'll colour SEC12 in this red colour here. So SEC12 is going to be involved in recruiting another protein to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So let's say this is the ER lumen on this side. So this is ER lumen. Okay, and this is the cytoplasm on this side. Now in the cytoplasm, there is a protein known as SAR1P. So here is SAR1P. Now when SAR1P is in its inactive state, what it has bound is guanosine diphosphate. Okay, now uh, what can happen is uh, SEC12 is capable of grabbing a SAR1P protein, chopping the guanosine diphosphate off of that SAR1P protein, and you've guessed it, it takes a GTP molecule from the cytoplasm and binds that GTP molecule onto the SAR1P protein in place of the GDP. So here's a GTP, and what it's going to do, basically, is it's going to replace the GTP um, for this GDP. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to create this SAR1P protein which has GTP bound to it. So here is our SAR1P protein, okay, here now with this GTP bound to it. And when it's got the GTP bound to it, what it does is it changes conformation and produces a little hydrophobic tail here. So this is this hydrophobic tail coming off of SAR1P. Okay, and that hydrophobic tail then allows SAR1P to sit in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So basically, when it was in its when it was bound to GDP, it didn't have this hydrophobic tail in, so it was quite happy flowing around in the cytoplasm. When it came into contact with SEC12, SEC12 cut off this GDP, took a GTP, bound the GTP to that SAR1P protein instead, and that caused this change in the SAR1P protein uh, that has made available this hydrophobic tail um, which uh, now means that the SAR1P protein uh, is able to implant itself in the membrane, basically. Well, the hydrophobic tail of the SAR1P protein is capable of implanting itself in the cell membrane. So I'll draw in pink here, GTP. Okay, so this came from here. So now what we've got is this SAR1P protein in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's going to kickstart everything else. But we'll continue this discussion in the next video.